If animals have the ability to suffer, then is it immoral to eat meat? What is the moral status of factory farming? If it's immoral to eat meat, then what is the scale of the atrocity being committed every year as billions of animals are slaughtered and eaten by humans? These are the questions I'm trying to answer on the 81st episode of Patterson in Pursuit. Hello, my friends, and welcome to the 81st episode of Patterson in Pursuit. This week, we're talking about a doozy of a topic. Is it immoral to eat meat? I know there are some passionate views out there. Many of you are probably vegetarians, and many of you are probably carnivores. I'm sure we have the whole spectrum covered on the show. But it's a topic I've not really addressed at all, and so I've brought Dr. Michael Humer back on the show, who has recently written a four-part series of dialogues on this particular topic. The articles are called Dialogues on Ethical Vegetarianism, and they will be linked in the show notes page this week, steve-patterson.com slash 81. Dr. Humer is back on the show in episode 59, where we talked about approaching infinity. So we've got a completely different topic for us to discuss today. We didn't only talk about vegetarianism and factory farming, we also near the end talked about empathy and whether or not it's normal to feel a certain way in particular circumstances and what the connection is between empathy and morality. We even got into a little tiny bit discussing free will and how it ties into morality. So if you're interested in this topic, I hope that you enjoy this episode. Dr. Mike Humer, welcome back to Patterson in Pursuit. It's great to have you back on the show to talk about the ethics of eating meat, which I consider to be one of the most difficult topics out there. But as you just told me a minute ago, you think it's not so uh, not so difficult. So I'm so glad uh, to have you to talk about this because you've recently been working on releasing content on this particular great. topic. Yes, thank you for having me. Where I kind of want to start with you, we might parallel a bit the dialogues, but I kind of want to start at the beginning, and then we'll I think we'll get into some some deeper topics. So let me give you my impression of the topic and why it's so difficult for me, and then you can help explain to me where I'm what what pieces of the puzzle I'm missing. So yeah. I have this general desire to not be in pain and to not undergo any suffering for myself. And I I look around, and I see other creatures, like other humans, and I assume that they're like me. I think if they act kind of as I act, you know, if I get poked with something, I say, ouch. If they get poked with something, they say, ouch. I think, okay, maybe they have this kind of internal experience. And then for some reason, I think, you know, I don't want those creatures to undergo suffering either just like i don't want to feel bad i don't want them to feel bad either and that's nice that sounds you know let, let's be nice to each other let's not hurt each other okay that's good that's easy going for humans but yeah. then i also look around at other creatures like animals dogs let's say and they also seem to feel pain if, if i poke them they will bark or, or yelp and then i think well hang on a second is it the case that all of these creatures have the same type of internal experience of feeling pain? And if so, it seems odd that with this particular set of creatures, I cut them up and I eat them. Like if we're talking about cows and pigs, I eat their flesh. (laughs) And uh, that would strike me as a bad thing if I were doing it to humans, and yet I have this exception for other creatures. So already I'm thinking, okay, what's going on here? How do you see this this problem? Like, is this a legitimate problem? Is this something that, you know, is only made up by philosophers who create problems when there are none? Or is there there really an issue here? Yeah. Yeah. It just sounds like you're immoral. So, um, (laughs) so, I mean, this seems like it parallel to a problem that people might have had a couple hundred years ago, where, uh, let's say, people in America are believing in individual rights, and they believe in individual rights for white people. But yet there's this other class Mm -hmm. of people, the Africans, and they're enslaving those people. And there's a conflict there. And well, you know, the answer is slavery is just wrong. 
And, you know, you're, why are you doing it? Probably just because uh, it's the convention in your society. Mm. So, and, you know, that, like that, that's what's happening with, uh, with animals and the meat. So you think um, it's just pretty straightforward. This is a this is a bad thing, and it's just it would be something like slavery. As we look back, you know, 150 years ago, appalled. Do you think in the future we're going to look back and say, "Gosh, this is a this was a huge ethical issue that they that that generation just overlooked"? Yeah, pretty much, right? So, I mean, you know, today when we look back at slavery, we kind of can't understand how somebody could have done that, or, or you know, I assume most of us. You know, how could you not see that that's wrong? But uh, people at the time couldn't see it. And like what we're not realizing is the force of social conventions. Mm. It's the convention in your society, then you just pretty much accept it. So uh, and it it can be something horribly wrong and you just keep doing it because it's the convention in your society. Right. Mm. Like that's what we miss when we think about slavery. But we don't have to miss it because we can just look at ourselves right now. <laughs> and, you know. Think about the things that we're doing right now just because it's society. So if that's the case, if that if it's that straightforward, then what kind of atrocity do you think is being committed? Because if if it's true that something as basic as eating meat is immoral, then you have a you've got a circumstance where most people on planet Earth are committing this this moral bad, you know, multiple times throughout a day, like, do do you view this as an an extreme, extremely bad issue, like an urgent issue? Yeah, it it might be the worst thing in the world. Like, people think that I'm exaggerating when I say the worst thing in the world. (laughs) Almost always when somebody says something is the worst thing in the world, they're exaggerating intentionally, Right. but not in this case. Uh, So, because the... The numbers, just the sheer numbers of animals involved are greater than the numbers of humans affected by any problem that we talk about, right? So, like, Mm -hmm. we kill something like 57 billion animals in one year worldwide just to enjoy their flesh. And almost all of them are in factory farms. Mm -hmm. So, 57 billion, the entire human population of the world is only 7.5 billion. Right. So like we're killing, you know, something close to eight times the entire human population in animals. Mm. And it's hard to see how that could not be the biggest problem. Mm. Well, so what about the so the other part of the intuition is, okay. well, there's a difference. There's a difference. It's not killing must not necessarily be a bad thing. When I walk around on the grass, I'm killing little insects under my feet. There's got to be this category distinction between humans which seem to be this really important creature and maybe the rest of them right do you buy that argument well well, um there might be relevant distinctions but uh it would be convenient if the distinction like is the the creatures that you care about matter like a million times more or maybe infinitely more than everything else if you're going to say you know some some creatures matter more than others uh, how do you know that the line is humans, you know, humans above the line and everything else below and everything mm-hmm. else below just either doesn't matter at all or mm-hmm. matters only one millionth as much? Mm-hmm. Uh, why would that be the case? Uh, so a couple of ideas that would come to mind, something is like general intelligence. So all these other creatures that are out there are, some of them seem like automatons when you're talking about insects, um, but yeah, maybe there's some there's some value that humans get because we're so supremely intelligent in comparison to the other species. Right. Yeah. Well, um, so as I as I say, um, if you think that so the usual response to that is, well, if you think that, then I guess that means that mentally retarded humans are fair game. Right? Mm. So there are some humans that have extremely low intelligence. In fact, there are there are profoundly retarded humans who can't even talk and would it be to have less intelligence than an average animal? Mm. Does it mean that it's okay to torture them and then, you know, possibly cut them into small pieces and eat their flesh? Mm. Most people have an immediate negative reaction to that. Uh, so it looks like, you know, we don't think that intelligence is that important. Right now, I think it might be true that uh, it does make your your life as a whole more valuable. So it might be true that if you have to either um, save it save a smart person or save a retarded person that you should save the smart person. Mm. Maybe that's true, but it's definitely not true that you can torture the retarded person. Mm. 
So what do you mean by torture? What if we're talking about like that sounds like it's in, you know, intentionally malicious. What if we're talking about the the sl the quick death like with the cows for example, they have that that machine that, you know, sticks a nail in their brain, you know, it's supposed to kill them instantly. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Well, um I mean what I mean is the the just the entire lifetime of most animals that are raised for food, their entire lifetime is an unhappy lifetime, right? Like they're stuffed into tiny crates or stuffed into these uh, barns, you know, just packed together with other animals, sitting in their own feces, uh, hardly able to move. You know, they have things like um, they cut off the beaks of chickens or they cut off the end of the beak. Mm -hmm. And the, it contains nerve endings, so it's probably incredibly painful, but there's no anesthetic for any of this. Um, and they, they just do things like this. Uh, they cut off the tails of pigs again, without anesthetic, which probably feels about the same as getting your finger cut off. Uh, and so it's just like, and then just the entire lifetime of the animal, they're not able to do any of their natural behaviors. It would be sort of like if you had to live in a small closet for your entire life. Mm -hmm. uh, if you did that to a human being, I think we would call it torture. Right? Like there would be no, if you did these sorts of things to human beings, actually there would be no doubt. Nobody would have a problem with calling that torture. So with those examples, like the cutting of the beak and the cutting of the tail, from what I understand, those are to prevent the animals from hurting each other. So like the, to prevent right. the chickens from pecking each other to death or from the pigs biting each other's tails off. It's kind of like, um, it'd be like a more extreme version of cutting your dog's nails that it might hurt. Right. And sometimes you might cut the quick, but it's actually kind of for their own good in those cases. Well, uh, sort of, I mean, it's for their own good in the context of being stuck together mm -hmm. with all these other animals in these unnatural conditions, right? But that doesn't take away the fact that it's probably extremely painful, right? So do you think that there is a kind of, like in the, the animal in its state of nature is, a, is definitely a happier animal? Right. Yeah. Okay. And I mean, you know, sort of like asking, well, would, would you rather live in a tiny closet? <laughs> <laughs> or, you know, just live a normal life. Well, but it does seem like there's a bit of a difference there with humans. So I'll, I'll just give, I'll, I'll make a devil's advocate case and I'll, I'll say my personal experience. Um, I can imagine plenty of scenarios where, let's say, the lives of dogs are t completely unnatural, let's say, in the United States. And yeah. they, they're essentially pampered um, compared to what life would be like as a wild dog. So I don't right. think it's just the unnaturalness of it that is either good or bad. But on the other hand, um, my wife and I have recently done some um, traveling in different places of the world. And when we were in, I think it was New Zealand or it might have been Ireland, they had um, like cows that weren't all packed together. They were out in these huge pastures. And, and I remember very vividly, but my wife and I were just talking about this the other day, like the little calf springing around as if she was like a four-year-old kid out on a field just like, like sp practically spinning around in circles just in joy which is not something that you see you know american cows don't do that they're too fat they're too crammed together but uh, right. uh, it seemed like an, it was not a state of nature but out there's a more definitely a, a seems to be a happier state when you give animals more space which is not you know hard to understand uh, yeah yes yeah, so, i mean as, as you uh, as you brought up the way that we treat our pets is typically much better than they would be treated in the wild. But the way that we treat livestock is much worse, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, the, the natural life isn't the best possible life, right? But, you know, living in a factory farm is very much worse. Right? Okay, um, so is, is your argument then really about factory farming being uh, an ethical issue versus just eating meat per se? So if, so if we had, if we raised all of our animals, let's say, on our own farms, killed them ourselves in a humane way, would you, do you think that's an ethical problem? Well, so, I mean, I think it's farming because of right? Like, I think almost any moral view I think any plausible moral view has that that's wrong. Um, if you if you had perfectly humane farms, then there would there would be an issue, right? Like different mm. moral views would disagree. Mm. Um, clearly, you can't torture other creatures, 
Uh, whether you can kill them painlessly then would be debatable and would depend upon whether you believe that they have rights. Mm. And to figure out whether they have rights, we would need like a theory of rights. We would need to know why anyone has rights in the first place, which is really hard to answer. Mm. Right? So, uh, so like, I, I don't have a theory of the foundations of rights. Uh, I think that I have them, but I don't really know why. So it's hard for me to say mm. who does or doesn't have them. I guess I'd say like, not sure then uh, you should try to avoid killing the creatures that even might have rights. Mm. Okay, so let, let's uh, kind of explore a little bit down that route. So why would we say at all that it is definitely a bad thing for consciousness to experience suffering? So that seems like it's kind of almost smacks of self-evidence, but really it's more of like... Yeah. Um, it's more like a description of this, the, a state of things that like for the conscious creature in that state, it probably would prefer not to be in that state. But why should we care about that? Why should we care about the preferences of conscious beings at all? Yeah, um, you know, I'm inclined to say that this is sort of an ethical axiom. You know, you, you can imagine somebody saying, well, yeah, why should we care about other humans, right? This is yeah. the challenge of the ethical egoist that people have been worrying about in ethics for a long time, right? Well, if you if you meet somebody who really doesn't care about anyone other than themselves, there's probably nothing you can do hmm. other than put that person in jail. Like, hmm. right. So you can't like persuade psychopaths to adopt morality. Hmm. Okay, but if you do care about people other than other than yourself, then it seems to me like the question is, well, why would there be a relevant difference between other people and just other sentient beings in general? Hmm. Okay, so. I think this is, uh, it's very compelling to have a kind of empathy towards, let's say, <laughs> higher order creatures. So humans is trivially easy for most people. Maybe their, their pets would probably be right up there, uh, maybe cows and stuff. But what about when you get down to the lower order creature? Let's say rats. So rats yeah. are something that most people don't like. They're not furry, they're not cuddly, and they're probably not tasty. <laughs> I don't know. I've, I've not eaten a rat, but they certainly don't look that way. And yet they seem to have the same, like, what, I, I would guess they still have the same internal experience. If you step on a rat or you poke a rat, it squeals. So are you saying the same argument would apply to something like you shouldn't use mouse traps that kill mice or like the harvesters that go through the fields and get, you know, get grain for the harvest that are killing a bunch of these creatures in the fields, they're also committing a kind of mini atrocity? Well, so, I mean, a couple of things. Like, one, we're not sure whether it's wrong to kill an animal painlessly. Though, you know, what you were just talking about probably wouldn't be very painless at all. Um, we're also not sure what's going on in the minds of other animals. Mm. So kind of the lower down they go or the, the simpler they are, the harder it is to imagine their experience. Mm -hmm. So we don't know if they're experiencing kind of the same thing that we would experience. Uh, so, you know, and that being said, I would say, well, you should probably avoid uh, doing things that plausibly might be causing harm <laughs> if you're not sure, if you don't have a good reason for doing it. Right? Okay. So a good reason for doing it would be, well, I have to do it to survive. Yeah. Um, a good reason for doing it is not, I'm going to slightly increase the pleasure during my meal. Well, what about if you have a mouse infestation? Because that's not a matter of life and death, but yeah, it's it's all convenience, but it seems like most people would be like, get the suckers out of there, you know, fumigate them, kill them, whatever you got to do. Yeah, um, I don't know. You know, uh, there's probably some painless way of getting rid of the mice, but I don't, I don't really know because I haven't looked into it. I never had a mouse infestation, so I never had to think about that. Hmm. Uh, you know, and I guess uh, I'm also kind of wondering what the mice are doing to you, to you that's so bad. Uh, well, that getting into your food would uh, be very expensive. Um, they're also, uh, they're they're dirty, they're gross, they can affect your, like your yeah. your health, physical well-being, which is not a life or death issue, it's like a quality of yeah. life issue. Um, yeah, I don't know. I mean, there's, you know, there's some point at which uh, it's okay to cause harm to other creatures. You have a pretty good reason. And, you know, it's not exactly obvious when the reason becomes um, good enough. Mm. Okay, it, but, you know, it I mean, like, there are some ahead. cases that we just know are not good enough. 
I mean, you you can sort of raise cases where you can imagine the the reason sort of getting stronger. You know, how how much of a nuisance are the mice getting to be? <laughs> yeah. And you can sort of you can have doubts about like how much experience mice actually have. So you can make it you can make cases where it's unclear whether it's okay, right? But I mean, I think that most people should focus on the clear case. So like you should first fix the thing that you're doing that's very clearly wrong. And then after that, kind of worry about other cases where you might be doing something wrong. So, but what if it's the case that these um, edge issues, these edge um, cases reflect on maybe one of our, one of our principles or one of our axioms are mistaken. So in the case of rats or small critters, um, I mean, you have millions upon millions that get chewed up in the combines, literally, as the you know, as the farm equipment's going through the field, it kills it kills a lot of creatures like in the farm equipment. It also takes away all of their land, so they essentially die, like you know, destroys their houses. You're causing all kinds of mental anguish if you're eating, even eating vegetables that are kind of mass produced. So if we, it seems like if we follow the line of reasoning that leads us to vegetarianism, it should also lead us to like planting our own food so that we don't rely on you know farm machinery right well i mean what you're doing is sort of describing cases in which you would have a lot stronger reasons for what you're doing and the reasons against it would be weaker Hmm. right and then sort of saying because of that case maybe we should maybe it's okay for us to continue our behavior in the case where we have much weaker reasons for doing it and we're causing more harm so that's probably not going to be a successful. Well, that's kind, kind of, of but that's kind of correct um, because it what it but what it's doing is it's challenging some of the fundamental claims. So if the because if this idea is that it's not okay to kill other conscious creatures for your own convenience, then that if that's the claim, if that's kind of the axiom or the ethical principle, then if then this would be a case. If it's a universal, then that would also say well you also have the ability to grow your own food and growing your own food means that a lot less creatures are going to die and you're not um, patronizing factory farming of vegetables, which kills a bunch of conscious creatures. So, but so if the latter case is not something that we would accept, I I would say, okay, well maybe that means that the axiom is not quite correct or the, the foundational principle isn't quite correct. Yeah. So the principle is not, it's always wrong to kill. Hmm. Uh, It's not even, it's always wrong to kill a sentient being. Okay. Uh, and right. In fact, we don't even think that about intelligent beings. It's not always wrong to kill an intelligent being. Right. You know, the the principle is something like, well, you have a reason for not causing pain and suffering, and in order to overcome that reason, you need to have pretty good reasons in favor of whatever action mm-hmm. would cause pain and suffering. So, right? so, but um, wouldn't that, couldn't we just say the yeah. same thing about the the vegetables? So, if it's the same argument you're causing pain and suffering by destroying all of the land and by killing a lot of them outright when you have a simpler yeah. alter you have a an alternative that is plausible that you're only choosing the more violent route because it's more convenient yeah i don't think i don't think this alternative is plausible okay so what is it like we're all going to go and become subsistence farmers so we have to basically dismantle all of industrial society and uh, we're all going to be living in poverty well, that I mean, I would, if you just think but, about the sheer but, magnitude of the benefits of modern society. I, I mean, I, I agree, but I'm, I'm challenging the principle. So I'm saying, actually, I think that is where the argument leads. That because you because you, what you're saying, you're making an economic case to commit a kind of ethical atrocity. So the this, this same argument, right? When the slave owner said, "Well, what are we supposed to do when if we don't have slaves, we're all going to be in poverty because the slaves are yeah. economically efficient." So. Right. If we reject that case, we, if it's the case that in order to live a morally good life, you have to be poorer, I think that wouldn't you have to choose the morally good life over the wealth? So you're sort of assuming what's in dispute. So I guess you're assuming that um, self-interest reasons can't outweigh moral reasons or something. If you have a moral reason for not doing something, a self-interested reason can't outweigh it. But uh, we know that that's yeah, false independently. I definitely wouldn't say that. I would say that if you're talking about weighing economic gain versus the weight 
of uh, the suffering of other conscious beings, it seems like if you want to have a kind of principle, then uh, I, I guess I should ask, make, maybe I should make this statement in a formal question. Uh, are you claiming that there is some kind of e purely economic trade-off where we're going to say, okay, if this action brings us that much wealth, then we can cause a bunch of uh, undue suffering to innocent creatures that you know did nothing wrong? Um, yeah. So, okay. so consider a related case. When, when you drive your car, there's always a risk that you're going to kill another person. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, uh, you know, just in case you're going to say that the other people deserve it because they're driving the car too, there's a risk that you'll kill a pedestrian. Mm -hmm. uh, in fact, something like, you know, 50,000 people are killed in car accidents every year. So why don't we stop this hor horrific practice? <laughs> right. Uh, well, yeah, yeah, it's basically because it would ruin our economy and kind of ruin our way of life. And, you know, it looks like there's a moral reason for not imposing a risk on other people, which you're doing every time you drive the car. It looks like your reason for doing it is basically an economic reason. Uh, it's a self-interested reason. But that doesn't mean that that it's impermissible, right? Well, I agree, but wouldn't why can I just say the same thing about factory farming, that the benefit is, is cheaper food that's ever existed for all of humanity. Like that's a big economic benefit. Yeah, but look, um, I mean, the, you get that benefit. In fact, you get more of it if you become vegetarian, right? There's going to be like food is going to be even cheaper if we become vegetarian, and we're going to continue to have the benefits of you know modern society. The only thing that will happen is that some of our meals will be less pleasurable. If you look at the sheer magnitude of the harm in question, with the 57 billion animals that are basically being tortured and then killed, like it's plausible that a single year of that outweighs most of the suffering in all of human history. Well, does, how much of this argument comes down to the to that economic claim that would actually be cheaper if we were to be vegetarians? Because I, I know coming from humble backgrounds, um, vegetables are very, very expensive in comparison to like cheap fast food. You can get a lot more nutrients, a lot more caloric density per dollar if you're eating at McDonald's than you can if you're eating uh, you know vegetables. Um, Wait, you mean you can get better by eating at McDonald's? <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, which is very important at the margins if you're poor, right? To be able to get fatter, to be able to get the that. Yeah, I think this yeah. is false. Uh, so, like, if you really wanted to get the cheapest calories, you know, get a bunch of rice or uh, and or potatoes or something like that, and you can get tons of calories from it, uh, and it's super cheap. And you can like you can buy you know big ten pound bags of rice. And stuff. I don't know how much that costs any, anymore, but. Uh, it's going to be really cheap. Yeah. But look, I mean, this isn't the main point, right? As I say, like the amount of suffering that we're causing, it just looks like the amount of suffering that we're causing to the non-human animals outweighs by orders of magnitude all of the benefits that we get from everything, from our entire existence, right? So it, it's not really plausible that you can justify causing that amount of harm hmm. to get a little bit more pleasure during meals or even if you were saving a little bit of money, right? Well, and I think there's the nutrient factor as well, right? Meat is packed with all kinds of things that you, it's really, really hard to get um, if you take meat out of your diet. There's all kinds of, uh, the big ones are like, you know, B12, that's the popular one, but there's all kinds of micronutrients as well that like you're not, if you eat a bunch of beans to try to get, for example, you're going to be causing inflammation in your body because there's, you know, phytates and things in the beans and same with flax seeds and, so it's not, it's not just, you know, I'm, yeah. I'm highly skeptical of this. So I'm skeptical of this argument partly because I think like um, most, most meat eaters are pretty unhealthy. And I think most <laughs> meat eaters, in fact, don't care about their health and are, you know, I think they're mostly um, eating tons of saturated fat and they're clogging their arteries and all this. But then, but then they only start talking about um, their health concerns when you start pressing them to change mm. to a vegetarian diet. Okay. But maybe you are a health nut. I don't know. Uh, um, well, it's actually a good example. Cause um, like my wife and I've been dealing with health issues for the past several years and we tried going vegan for a bit and uh, felt terrible. Um, and a lot of people have that experience. And so, yeah, as we've been so trying to build a healthy diet, good quality you're meat is doing a... it wrong. <laughs> <laughs> you're probably doing it wrong. Um, so, I haven't I haven't noticed any problems 
So I can say, so like, I'm not an expert on nutrition. I haven't really researched that. I was never worried about it. Um, nothing bad ever happened to me, you know, from not eating meat the last, uh, like 20 or 30 years or something. Although, you know, in fairness, I, I'm also eating scallops and clams and things like that, mm. which don't have a brain. So you probably get this, the same nutrients. Yeah, I, I definitely, definitely don't think, um, that you can, uh, it might be possible in theory to get the kind of nutrients from a, a vegetarian or vegan diet that you can when you eat meat. But I think it's uh, extremely difficult and really not realistic for the vast majority of people who don't have a long time to plan these things out. And like you mentioned saturated yeah. fat, that there's the, so like in the world of nutrition, there's been this dogma for a long time, well, maybe 40 years, something like that, that saturated fat is this really bad thing. And turns out it's not a, a bad thing. And, and, proper circumstances, saturated fat is really good for you. It's really good for your animal, animal saturated fat, animal fat is really good for your body. It's really good for your brain. Um, that's, so there's, there, so there's very strong yeah. evidence that says actually our bodies benefit greatly from eating high quality meat. Now, crappy meat, you might be so, correct. And I, I would, I would agree with that. Yeah, go ahead. So I'm skeptical, skeptical about this. And okay. this is the first time somebody say that. Um, I'm not a nutritionist, so I'm not like I'm not going to argue about that. Um, I'll just say that you know you can find um, you can, you can go argue with Mylan Engel, who talks about uh, you know the, uh, the health benefits of being vegan. So but as I say, um, okay, you need you need some uh, meat in your diet. So just convert to uh, only eating you know scallops, clams, and oysters, which don't feel pain. And, you know, you'll still get, you'll get the protein and whatever. But, but that's so not correct. Three, no. Yes. Okay. But, 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 two, okay. Two things. So f first, I, um, I definitely don't think that's correct. It's not the case that meat or it meets interchangeable. Red meat has different things in it than scallops has different things than fish, different things than poultry. But let's say for the sake of argument that that's correct. Let's say that there, are, that in fact, meat is good for you in the right context, would that change the argument? Does that actually change whether or not what you're claiming is correct? Uh, so it depends on how large the benefits are supposed to be, hmm. right? But so with most ethical questions, sort of you can describe a bunch of hypothetical cases that are difficult. Mm -hmm. And I think it's usually unproductive to try to answer all of the hypothetical cases. Hmm. Uh, frequently, we find that we're just not in the difficult case. And thus, um, we don't have to spend a lot of time you know, peacefully trying to resolve the difficult case. Right? Hmm. Um, so like, I think our actual case is, well, the actual reasons that we have for eating meat are just not anywhere close to being strong enough. Hmm. Right, so um, I don't like, I frequently have people like, so periodically students will tell me something about how, oh, they can't give up meat because something is going to happen to their health. And I simply don't believe them. And you might think that, um, well, you know, since I'm not a doctor or a nutritionist, uh, I don't have any right to not believe them, but I don't believe them. I think that they're making rationalizations <laughs> and I haven't experienced any of the negative consequences that I'm supposed to have from not eating meat. So... I think it's both. What about all the other people, like the tons and tons of people online who say, I tried to go, ve try to go vegan, try to go vegetarian, and I had all of these side effects? Like, there's a lot. Um, that's a huge community of people. No, no. You know, like, I, so I haven't seen a scientific survey. Um, they might have been doing it wrong. So I have no doubt that it's possible to construct a vegan diet that's not good for you. <laughs> Uh, but, you know, it's also possible to construct one that's fine. So they were probably just not doing it right. But I mean, so so just to push back a little bit here, your argument is appealing to your own personal experience and body composition in, in saying, well, because I've been doing this, I don't believe other people. And the, the human body is this unbelievably complex system that is that varies from person to person of like, some people are allergic to grains and other people aren't. And there's all these variables. So to say, because you've tried it for 20 years, other people, when they report their experiences are wrong, seems dubious. I mean, you know, of course, it's not just me. There are many vegans who are doing fine. 
And uh, I think it's very plausible. So it just before doing the experiment, like, of, of course, you should believe that some vegan diets are unhealthy, right? Like, we can already assume that. So I think it's a priori very plausible explanation that, um, you know, some of the people would be doing it wrong, right? So and what about the set of people, hypothetically, who are doing it right, doing it by the book, and, and even ethically motivated to do so, and let's say that failed, what, like, let, let's say they got depression because they weren't getting enough saturated fat or whatever it is. Do you think in those cases, if your body composition is such that really it does significantly affect your, your well-being, do those people get kind so, of an exception to the ethical rule? Well, so I, I don't know exactly what we're talking about. Hmm. So, and um, I don't know if these are real cases or just hypothetical. <laughs> So I'm not, I'm not sure what the answer to that. So I don't think that uh, we're going to get very far on this mm. because uh, we're debating about an empirical scientific question and neither of us is a scientist. Um, there are people who know about this, uh, in, you know, including some people who are vegans that, you know, that would be more appropriate to talk to. But I can't like argue about the details of biochemistry. Uh, no, or things like that. I'm trying to give a theoretical um, example. So okay, but, I, I, I'm saying, I mean, I can, yeah, yeah. I mean, like, I'm skeptical when I hear about things like this. I, I, when I try to articulate why I'm skeptical, like, I think it has to do with the fact that when talking to people about vegetarianism, I get so many things that are obvious nationalizations. Yeah. That when I hear a new thing, if I don't know for a fact that the factual claims are true, then I tend to suspect that it's another rationalization. Mm. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I don't think that's. I, I hear you. I mean, there, there's bad arguments on all on all sides of of every issue. I totally agree. But I, I'm not. So I'm saying, in the theoretical case, that uh, there are people. There's this set of people. Maybe it's large. Maybe it's small. Maybe it's non-existent. I'm saying, in the circumstance in which actually the vegan diet significantly reduces your quality of life for whatever reason. We can imagine that, you know, somebody's got some, let's say, genetic abnormality where they can't digest soybeans properly or whatever it is. Uh, does the yeah. rule then not apply? Do those people, will we say, okay, now in those individual cases, they it is justified for them to eat uh, meat or maybe just humanely raised meat? Or what do you do with those hypothetical people? Right, yeah, they should probably try to minimize the amount of suffering. So they should probably try to get the certified humane meat, mm. um, which is uh, for animal welfare organizations that uh, examine, you know, meat producers. And uh, so certified humane is a specific organization that looks at, um, you know, whether they're humanely raised and slaughtered. Mm. They should probably just try to minimize that. Uh, you might also try to um, only eat meat from the animals that you think are less likely to be sentient or something like that, or mm -hmm. less sentient than other animals. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. So um, last thing that I want to talk about, we've kind of hit it at a couple of angles here, but it's this idea, uh, it's kind of like an abstract um, scale that you have. Like on the one hand, you have the benefits of eating meat in addition to factory farming. And on the other end of the scale, you have the massive amount of suffering that's caused by that action. And you weigh them and you say, okay, it is very clear that the benefits do not outweigh the costs. So there's a couple things I want to ask you about that. One is, um, are you appealing to a kind of uh, objective moral system when you, make, when you say that that's very clear? Or is it appeal to kind of our, almost everybody's intuitions on the topic? You know, like you, you, you weigh one versus the other. It's kind of like... Um, Let's say eating, eating something gross. You know, eating eating vomit is like pretty much universally seen as gross, and we all have this very strong th gut feeling that it's just it's just gross. But that doesn't necessarily mean it's like some objective principle that that is gross. So, is are you uh, when it comes to ethics, is that what you're doing? Are you saying it's objective, or it's just this kind of thing that we agree to? So, um, as as you might know, I'm I'm a moral realist, so I. Like on any ethical question, I think there's an objectively correct answer. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I'm not like this. This particular issue isn't special. Mm. Uh, so if somebody asks me, like, why should you not murder children? You know, and then, 
um, well, you know, it's causing a lot of harm. You don't have any good justification for it. And then you say, okay, but are you claiming that that's an objective moral truth? No, like every moral truth is objective moral truth. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, if you don't believe in objective moral truths, so that like there are multiple different theories that people have that are alternatives, um, but they generally try to preserve of some of our intuitions about things that are right or wrong. Mm. So like people who people who hold some subjectivist theory still try to explain why it's wrong to torture children. Okay, so what I want to say is um, if you have some um, anti-realist theory or whatever your theory of ethics is, if you have some theory that can still explain why you can't uh, torture children, it will probably also get you to the result that uh, factory farming is wrong. Mm -hmm. Okay. So and then the other question about that is uh, maybe a little bit more meta. And it, when we're making these kind of one of the, one of the reasons I, I struggle with ethics in general, not just of this particular topic, but ethical ideas in general is because I, I haven't overcome like some basic skepticism about about the foundations, like the meaning of of ethical claims. But that aside, it does seem odd that in this circumstance, when we're trying to decide is it is some particular phenomena wrong or right is this an atrocity or something that's not a big deal that we are kind of by default giving a special exception to humans because we're saying oh we're we're these moral creatures like when we see a a, a lion horribly maul some other creature it's like oh well that's nature okay we don't we don't think I, I, correct me if i'm wrong but i don't think mo most people i don't think feel like animals in general are moral creatures why then do we give ourselves the exception? If we're a part of nature, why would we even be having this discussion? It's like, well, we're just doing whatever we're doing. We're just another species that has discovered farming, and that's the way it is. Yeah. I mean, well, human beings have sort of developed over time from being, you might say, more animal-like to being more uh, civilized, I guess. Mm. So, but I mean, if you... If you say, oh, well, why don't we just like act according to our nature, you know, follow our instincts, mm. including other animals, that also includes making war on other humans. Right? So maybe we should go back to um, raiding other tribes in order to kill the men and kidnap the women. Right? Mm. Well, uh, no, I mean, it's a large amount of progress. You know, there's a lot of, large amount of progress that's happened that consisted in kind of restraining our natural impulses. And you might think, well, oh, so then, you know, why don't we get lions to restrain their natural impulses? And the answer is that we can't. So, like, if hmm. if um, we could make lions become more intelligent and morally sensitive, then great, right? But there's no plausible plan for making that happen, right? Hmm. So when you're making, when you're um, c concluding about different creatures and their capacity for uh, making moral decisions, is another uh, kind of assumption here or something that we, we pack into our framework of an analyzing this issue that humans even have the ability to make moral decisions? Like, does this whole theory presuppose some kind of will, some kind of free will that we're also saying, well, these other creatures maybe don't have it, but we actually genuinely have the ability to choose. And that's why, where we get moral claims. Because it seems like if we didn't have the ability to choose, well, then moral claims don't really have any purpose to yeah be. yeah human beings have well we have the ability to choose and kind of moreover the ability to use intellectual moral reasons to overcome our instinctive drives hmm. right so there's the thing that you feel like doing when and the thing that will give you pleasure and then there's the thing that when you reflect seems like the right thing to do hmm. Non-human animals generally don't have the ability to do the thing because it's morally right. They just have the ability to do the thing that they want to do, or right. Um, that's why we can have moral obligations. The non-human animals can't have moral obligations, mm. but that doesn't mean that we can't do wrong to them, right? They can't do wrong because they don't—they don't really have free will in the same way that humans do. Mm. We can still do wrong to them because we have free will and we have the ability to reflect on our actions and not do the thing that we feel like. Mm. Is that another is the, how essential is that assumption to the the I guess not just this moral case, but all of all of moral claims 
that you could make is that we do have the ability that I guess that we have free will. Is that something that's just packed in from the start? You, we, we have to assume it because otherwise we don't get any, any morality really, or any, any meaning or like obligatory power to our moral conclusions if we can't choose in the first place. Yeah, I think, um, so yeah, this isn't specific to this moral issue. I think every moral issue requires an assumption that we have free will. Hmm. But I mean, this is one of these things where, you know, there's a philosophical controversy about it, but most philosophers, so philosophers who would deny free will, there are some philosophers who deny that we have free will. Most of them would try to come up with some account of why you can still talk about morality. Hmm. Right. So, and if you can't, then, you know, that's a big, that's a big mark against your theory. Right. right. Like if your view is we don't have free will and that entails that there's nothing wrong with torturing babies, hmm. then uh, there's something <laughs> wrong with your theory. Right? <laughs> well, so what if what if the theory were something like we don't have free will and that's why when we say it is wrong to torture babies, what we really mean is uh, it, it will result in bad outcomes if we torture babies or I have a negative feeling towards torturing babies, something like that. Yeah. And, you know, my response would be, that's not what it means. <laughs> so, so when we use this, talk about uh, right and wrong and what you should and shouldn't do. So one function of it is um, it's used for evaluating other people and deciding how we feel about their behavior. But another function of it is uh, it's used for decision making. So when you make judgments about what you should do, you then use those to decide what to do. Hmm. And, uh, and that's crucial to the concept of should. Uh, if you don't think that you have free will, then like the the whole thing doesn't kind of doesn't make sense. Right? If you don't think you have free will, then you can't say that you should or shouldn't do anything. Right. Uh, and then when you're deliberating about what to do, um, your deliberation doesn't make sense. Right. Like it doesn't make sense to be deliberating about what to do if you don't have any choice about what to do. Well, you don't have a choice in your deliberation either. Yeah, you're you're you must think that you're you know being forced to deliberate or something. Right. You have no choice but to deliberate, right? But I think it's sort of impossible to seriously take on this anti-free will view, right? Like you're going to be constantly disbelieving your own theory, and you're constantly struggling to get yourself to believe it, right? But constantly failing. I agree, and that's a whole other. Maybe that actually is the hardest issue. I really have no. Free will is one of those things where when I, th when I think about the theory of it, I go, gosh, how could that work? And then I think about the, the experience of being me, and I think, how could it be that we don't have it? It's like this, this really difficult pickle. But that actually brings us to the beginning of the conversation, because at the beginning of this conversation, we were talking about whether or not there's this kind of category exception for humans versus the other creatures. But maybe we actually just discovered it. Maybe, maybe that's the ethical principle, is that don't inflict unnecessary suffering on creatures that have free will, because humans seem to be the creatures, at least, that do have free will. Right. So, so then it's going to be permissible to torture babies, because uh, babies probably don't have free will. And, you know, uh, babies are really dumb, okay? Uh, <laughs> it might also be permissible to torture like, no, they can't do anything. They just sit there crying, right? Okay. Uh, so they're not reflecting on their actions and forming moral beliefs and deciding to restrain their impulses or anything, right? Um, it's also probably going to become permissible to torture uh, some mentally ill people, right? So uh, plausibly, some mental illnesses take away your ability to deliberate and rationally reflect on your actions. Uh, and I assume that we don't think that. Uh, it's not permissible to do anything needlessly on those people. So do you think then that free will is something that is not given to humans as a general category? It's something that kind of evolves in some humans or maybe most humans. They eventually develop the capacity of it at, at some point in their development. You develop free will as you grow up, right? You have, hmm. uh, when you're first born, you have an extremely low degree comparable to non-human animals. Hmm. And then it develops. Uh, also, you know, you can have mental or uh, brain damages that can inhibit your free will, right? Hmm. Okay. If that, this is really interesting. If you, I, I'm, I don't know about um, free will, but I am really curious about this, this idea of the development of it and this maybe intimate connection with the rational faculty and the ability to choose. 
But would you agree with the, the following claim that in one particular species of creature, it seems to be that they have developed some metaphysically distinct and unique capacity that is in contrast to the way that the rest of the universe works really profound and remarkable like we don't talk about planets having will we don't talk about plants having will uh, we don't talk about practically anything else and yet it's yeah. is it as remarkable as it seems when you give it that kind of uh story or perspective um i don't understand free will so i'm not sure how amazing it is <laughs> uh, i think consciousness is amazing i think consciousness is the like the real thing that the part uh some things from you know most of nature mm. and that's the thing that we should be most amazed by mm. um developing free will is sort of uh it's a further development of the mystery of consciousness but i think it's it's not so the difference between a conscious and a non-conscious being is a very large qualitative difference mm. the difference between beings that have free will and those that don't is i think more of a difference of degree mm. Because the beings that we say have free will, namely us, um, we don't have the maximum degree of freedom, right? We're not perfectly free. And the beings that we say don't have free will, they just have very little free will, right? They have little freedom, hmm. right? So, like, it's sort of like the non-human animals have very low levels of intelligence, which don't enable them to think very hard about what they're doing. Hmm. They don't, it doesn't give them very much control over their actions, right? Um, but as you get more intelligent and more reflective and maybe more self-aware, maybe more aware of your own impulses and more able to reflect on the reasons for and against actions, then you get more control. But that obviously comes in degrees. Hmm. Right? So you know, it starts out really low, and then uh, we, we normal adult human beings have pretty high levels, but we could develop more in the future. So I'm guessing then that your perspective on moral intelligence maybe is as similar to your perspective on general intelligence in the sense that it really is a, a process of evolution that we see in nature lower levels of intelligence and we see actions that correspond to low levels of general intelligence and uh, humans might be in the process of developing their, their um, moral intelligence so just like a thousand years ago things that seemed totally reasonable actually turn out to be appalling um, maybe at present, things that seem totally reasonable, like, oh, yeah, going down to the burger store and getting a burger, might in the future, in hindsight, seem to be totally appalling because we're on that spectrum of evolution. Yeah, I think that's right. Mm. Um, so, I mean, I don't, I don't think of moral thinking as being totally different from thinking in general. Mm. So I think there's general intelligence, and you use your general intelligence and your faculty of reason in general to think about morality. Mm. But it's just that people started out not knowing much about this, just as they started out not knowing much about every other subject. Mm. So, like the theories that people had about physics and uh, biology and medicine and, and geography, they were all totally wrong. And then they just gradually get better over time, mm. which is like the way our moral views are getting better over time, right? Mm -mm. But, like, people today, when we think about uh, the theories of a thousand years ago, when we think about the scientific theories of a thousand years ago, we think they are just ridiculously wrong. They're basically totally wrong. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that's a, a similar phenomenon, right? It's, it's much as when we look at their moral views, we think that they're totally wrong. Mm. Yeah. Um, well, I think that's a great note to end on. And a couple of times we've kind of bumped into this, uh, this consciousness is, is this big part. And you, you dropped a really interesting phrase there. You said that you, you know, consciousness maybe is the the thing that is most remarkable, that is like the biggest category difference between what is conscious and what is unconscious. I tend to agree, but I would love to know your, your thoughts on that because I'm exploring myself. I'm pushed into something like a metaphysical dualism, like a, a hard Cartesian substance dualism that there is mind and there is world and maybe an interaction between the two, but they're like categorically separate things. Uh, but I wonder what your thoughts are on that. Obviously we can't talk about it, but maybe you can come back on the show and share your, uh, your metaphysical thoughts on what the mind is. Yes, I'm sympathetic to a kind of emergent dualism. Okay. But I don't have time to uh, to defend that now. Right, right. Well, great. Thanks uh, Thanks very much for coming on the show. And I, you know, I, I feel like maybe this is one of those things, if morality is uh, on the spectrum of intelligence, maybe I've got some kind of intelligence block here because I really have a difficult time 
like re- I don't have a difficult time feeling the the pull of uh, moral reasoning because uh, yeah. I, I definitely am, am, I, I, I empathetic compelled, but the rational justification of finding the foundations, I just uh, I have a real block on even getting to the point where you know, ethical claims have in, are like something more than statements of preference, you know. Yeah. Well, uh, you know, uh, just think about how you would respond to somebody who is violating other people's rights in very severe ways. And, you know, they think, well, it's just ethics is just a matter of preference. And uh, if you have a view that explains why they shouldn't, like why you shouldn't, you know, rob other people or beat other people up and so on. It'll probably also explain why you shouldn't torture animals. Uh, and if you don't, if your view implies that there's nothing wrong with beating up other people, then you know you're probably um, you're probably getting confused. Right? You're just, like you're you're probably wrong. You, know, you should probably set aside the abstract theory. <laughs> I guess the difficult, like I, when I think about the feeling, I, I have I very much have a, a deep feeling that people that are violating other people's rights are you know, jerks and it makes me feel horrible and I, you know, would want to bonk them on the head, that type of thing. But I have a hard time distinguishing is, is that feeling of disgust categorically separate than a feeling of disgust if somebody, you know, is going and eating vomit? Like it really is a very strong feeling of disgust. And, that, you know, I just can't identify if that's in the same category or if it's in a totally, a completely separate category. Yeah. Well, they're both feelings, but uh, so... I mean, there are plenty of things that people have done that were wrong, but I didn't feel disgusted, and there are plenty of things that I find that I don't think are wrong. I don't think eating vomit is wrong, and like I'm not even at all tempted to think that. Um, there, you know, there are cases where you can judge something to be wrong, even though you don't have any personal feelings about it. So it was wrong of Emperor Nero to kill Agrippina, which is like 2,000 years ago. Yeah, uh, I know that it was wrong, but I don't care. You don't have like, a you don't have right. a feeling of disgust about it. I don't think so. You know, if it is, it must be such a slight feeling that I'm not noticing. It. Because uh, you know, what's what is Agrippina to me? That happened two thousand years ago. Like I never even knew either of those people. Uh, now I could probably get myself to feel more about it if um, if there was like a really vivid description that filled in all of the details, yeah. right? And so that I could have this vivid image in my mind, then I'd probably feel something about it. But I, I do, I do feel something about it. And and that, it was interesting. You made that distinction to think things that I, I totally accept that there would be things that are not wrong that you feel disgust. But the other one, things that are wrong that you don't feel disgust. I'm thinking, well, I, it's hard for me to think of something like that that I don't feel some measure of disgust if something is morally, I would call morally wrong. Do you have any other examples? Um. Yeah. Are you, are you sure you really mean disgust? Because, uh, like, I mean, yeah. To me, the things that you, the things that are disgusting, are a small subset of the things that are wrong. Like, uh, okay, you know, somebody embezzled money from their company, so I think that's wrong. I don't think that's disgusting. Right? Well, it depends on the con. It depends on the context. So, like, if, if, if concretely, if it's the case that in the process of embezzling money, they're breaking a bunch of contracts, lying to a bunch of people, and harming people, then yeah, I do, I do definitely feel disgust like a disgust mixed with an anger i think would be the that flavor of emotion yeah yeah like so you know i would feel anger if if it has something to do with me um and i might be able to feel anger if enough details were filled in even if it didn't have to do with me like vividly imagining the victims or something like that um but it it seems weird to me to feel disgusted by what is the thing that you feel? So like with the, the circumstance of you know, somebody murdering somebody else 2,000 years ago, is it just like a, is it just, yes, I know factually speaking that that is a bad thing, although I feel nothing? Don't you feel bad for the family or, or the, that, that, that injustice took place? Well, I'm, I'm not feeling much of anything, right? <laughs> you know, um, I don't know if I'm unusual or if you're unusual. <laughs> okay. I don't know either. But, but. I find it hard to feel much of anything about like some person who lived 2000 years ago about whom I know nothing other than that she was murdered. Really? Right? Like, like, all I know is that she was Nero's, either his mother or his wife. He killed both of them. And, uh, and he murdered her. 
That's all I know. You know why so that it's is? It's hard for me to feel anything. It's because I, you know why that is. It's because you're not eating enough animal fat, <laughs> and so <laughs> so it's a matter of health. That's a, that's a, that's a joke. That's a joke. But I say, uh, well, it could be a benefit. It it could be, and what, I don't know if I'm the oddball or if uh, or if we're the oddball in this circumstance because it almost seems like that. I, and and that's also why I have this difficulty with the category distinction of de, of determining whether or not there's something unique about ethical claims versus you know claims of preference or statements of feelings of disgust and that type of thing. Because in my own internal experience. I have a difficult time imagining something that I really believe is morally wrong and I don't have a the same general like conscious feeling of disgust. Fascinating. Um, okay, yeah, I don't know. So I was, I was going to say, I, I don't know if this is true, but I hypothesize, you know, uh, probably you're unusual because uh, usually the emotions that people have are tied to themselves. So usually you feel mad because something negatively impacts you. Um, also, like the feeling of disgust, I would think, usually has to do with some kind of contamination. So if you think that something will contaminate, um, you know, its environment, then that thing is just. Oh, oh, you know what I think? I, I think it would be something like I'm disgusted by the human that uh, the, the, the dirty or contaminated human that would do such a thing. So my disgust maybe is directed towards my feelings about the human Nero rather than the actual act itself. Yeah, right. You know, um, Nero's character in general was probably disgusting. Right, right. Uh, but, you know, uh, uh, I've, I've also heard that libertarians tend to be uh, lower on empathy than people with other um, political ideologies. Huh. But, I, you know, empathy has a lot to do with our moral reactions. But I, I wouldn't have a problem, I wouldn't have any difficulty empathizing if I actually saw Agrippina. Like if I actually saw the individual who was being wronged, or if I knew details about their lives, I wouldn't have any trouble empathizing. I just empathize with somebody in an abstract scenario, right? But where but all the, I know but is you, that they're the victim of a crime. But you know that the abstract is correlating to the concrete, so it's like that—that that you don't know the details is of yeah, course, would, but it's still yeah. Like, I, know, I know that there are details, right? So, you know, that might be part of how I know that it's wrong. Right? Hmm. Uh, so I don't know. But I know that I would feel a negative reaction. You know, if I uh, if I witnessed the scenario, if I knew the details or something like that. OK, so this is I, I don't want to keep you too long, yeah. but I got to ask you a basic question now, because you brought up a word that I don't understand. Uh, and especially in this context, which is empathy. So is is empathy the thing that one is feeling when you observe or think about the injustice or is empathy like the ability to have feelings of this nature or something else well um i mean could be both depending on the context right but so you know it's sometimes used as uh, used to refer to a capacity and maybe sometimes used to refer to an episodic mental state like mm -hmm. you're empathizing right now mm -hmm. um but it's sort of being able to put yourself in the other person's shoes and kind of imagine their experience from their perspective. Um, you're probably not really imagining what it's like. Like you're not imagining fully right. what it's really like, but you know, you're having an experience that is something like the experience that they're having. But of course, like when you, when you empathize with someone who's in pain, you know, you're not like feeling a pain that's like the pain that they're feeling. Right. But you're sort of able to understand from the inside what that's like. Yeah. Okay. So maybe this is a that would that that maybe puts it in context because a, a circumstance in which I kind of have this the same thing that I think you're describing is when it's not about people and maybe it's about numbers. So six billion people died in the Holocaust. Six million Jews were killed by Germans in uh, in the Holocaust. That for me, I definitely have a feeling. I have the same same kind of feeling. That I did when you mentioned the case, you know, two thousand years ago, but it's not correlated to the number six million. Like I don't feel it six million more times. It's purely abstract. Like I, I can't, couldn't even comprehend the the measure of feeling that, you know, that feeling of emp empathy magnified six million times. So that's a case where it's like I know it's wrong, and it's six million times more wrong, but I can't feel that. Right. Yeah. You know the the famous quotation attributed to Stalin that um, a single death is a tragedy, a million deaths is a statistic. Right. He probably didn't actually say that, 
Uh, you know, most great quotes turn out to be apocryphal. <laughs> right. But it's, you know, it's still a, still a good point. And, um, you know, it's possible that you would feel more from a vivid story about a single person being killed. Right. And hearing a news item about millions of people being killed. But you still know that the millions of people being killed is worse. Right, right. And I like I think this is related to the animal ethics issue. I think most people have difficulty empathizing with beings who are not of their own species. And you can understand evolutionary reasons for why that would be. But uh, even if you have trouble empathizing with them, you should reflect and like you can still know that it's wrong. Right. Yes. You can still know that it's wrong without the empathy, just as you know that the killing the six million people is wrong. Yeah, and I think uh, I think just imagining the circumstances that a lot of these animals are in in factory farms, just supplant a cow for your house pet, and I think people would have no difficulty um, having a very strong feeling of empathy for animals in that circumstance. Right. Yeah. All right. Well, that's a great conversation. Um, I appreciate it, Doctor Humor, and. I think I'm going to have to invite you back on the show a third time to talk about consciousness because it's rare yeah. that there are substance dualists out there. Um, and so, I, or I, what, emergent is dualists, dualists of any sort. Yeah. So that there's yeah. a comrade, uh, I definitely want to pick your brain on that too. All right, that was my conversation with Dr. Mike Humer, who's a professor of philosophy at the University of Colorado at Boulder. As with pretty much any other topic, you see, these ideas are come bundled together. It's usually not just straightforward, is eating meat good or bad? We also have to incorporate ideas about free will, because if we don't have free will, well, we can't choose, and that kind of takes away the power of ethical statements. We also have to get into nutrition. Is it the case that eating meat is really good for you or essential for you? If your brain is starved from good animal fats and it results in people being more likely to be depressed, well, does that change the ethical position on eating meat? You have to also import ideas about consciousness. If it's the case that animals aren't conscious, then of course it wouldn't be a problem eating them. Well, then what is consciousness? Where does it come from? How does it work? So in my opinion, unless you really understand all these different areas and have working theories based on sound foundations, trying to come up with a coherent answer to the problems of eating meat, uh, I think is a lost cause. But I don't think that's unique to this particular topic. And this is why in the content that I'm releasing, the interviews that I'm having cover lots and lots of different topics. I try to create a rational worldview, put all the pieces of the puzzle together so that questions like this can be consistently answered but that's all for me today. I hope you guys enjoy the rest of your week.